My reading is taken from Mark chapter 9 from verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, firming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And then the next reading is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May, may the Lord bless this reading according to his word. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so... Who of you like crossword puzzles? Okay, three-letter word. Middle letter is G. The clue is Easter. Are you sure? Okay, yes, it's egg. Right. The next one. Nine-letter word. The last two letters are ST. It's the clue is the first meal of the day. Really? <laughs> okay. Are you sure? I said, you know, the clues are too easy. Oh. All right, the next one. Okay, it's a nine-letter or oh, six-letter word. It, Oh, you know. <laughs> All right, okay, you've got it. All right. And when we talk about Thomas here, you know, with the clue being doubter, we're obviously talking about Thomas in the New Testament. Yeah? Because shame, poor old guy. He's the one that that, that name is forever going to haunt him as being Thomas the doubter. Poor guy. What a rap. You know, he's the one that that wouldn't take the other's word for it that Jesus has risen. He wouldn't take their word for it. But what's the first word that pops into your mind when you, if, so, if you say the word Thomas? Is it doubter that, that you think of? 
No, you think about doubting. When somebody says uh, his name is Thomas, uh, especially in a biblical reference, then it's a case of, well, yeah, doubting. But if you ask a kid, a little kid, you say Thomas, and what is the first thing that comes into your mind? They'll say, oh, Thomas the train. You know, that blue train with a big smiley face and all the adventures he goes on. But no, we're not talking about trains this morning. We're talking about Thomas, the Thomas, that doubting, the doubting one. And maybe you're going to see a little bit of yourself in him as well. I think Thomas reminds us of, of who we are and what we're made of. You know, it's a case of 50% belief, 50% unbelief. You know, we're, we're all, we all want proof, but God is about faith. But what do we know about Thomas the disciple? Well, he was listed amongst the 12 of the, the disciples that Jesus hand-picked to be with him during those three years of his ministry on earth. He's listed in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also he's mentioned once in the book of Acts. And all we, we have to go on about Thomas is what we find in the Gospel of John. Because there he's mentioned about five times, and along with that familiar passage that Carol read to us this morning, that familiar one about, well, I don't, you know, I, you know, I want to see proof. I want to see it for myself. But let's put this, all, this whole thing into context. And maybe it's old hat because we've looked at it over the last two Sundays, but this, this is the Sunday of Jesus' resurrection, where he has now appeared to the women and he's told the women, go back to my brothers and tell them to meet me in Galilee. But we know where the disciples are. Where are they? They're locked up in a room in Jerusalem for fear of the Jews. And we know that Jesus has, has appeared to those two who were walking on the road to Emmaus, to Cleopas and, and his friend. And we know that he, Jesus has also appeared to Peter. And there they are, the, this group of them in this upper room, talking about their experience to the disciples. And the disciples are still a bit unsure whether this has really happened, that Jesus is really alive. And then poof, Jesus appears in their midst, right there in front of them all. And as Mark writes, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that Mary had seen them, they didn't believe it. And when the two returned from Emmaus and reported to the rest what they had seen, they didn't believe them either. It was, in, it was only when Jesus appeared himself in that locked room and showed them his wounds that they believed that he was risen. And as John writes, they were overjoyed. But Thomas wasn't in that room. Thomas wasn't there. And why? Well, there are some theories. We don't know why he wasn't there, but there, there are some theories. One is that he went into hiding. He said, well, you know, if they've got Jesus and they've killed him, who knows? You know, the Romans could be after us next. They could be after me, so I'm going to go into hiding. You guys, are you fine? You go into that room, you lock themselves there, you're all a nice prime target for the Romans. You're all together. I'm going to go hide somewhere else. In this case, it, there's no safety in numbers. I'm going to be on my own. Another one is that he went into mourning. It was a case of, well, you know, this is, I've, I've lost the guy that I was following, the guy that I dearly, that, that taught me so much. I thought, I'm just going to go into mourning and I'm going to go sit in a corner and I'm going to mope. There's another theory that he went back to work. So, well, Jesus is dead. You know, I've, got a food, I've got a stomach to fill. I need to do something. There's no miracles, there's no Jesus going around, and there's nothing that we can buy or anything. We're on our own, so I'm going to go out to fish. I'm going to go back to work. But what we do know about Thomas is that he was told by those ecstatic disciples that day, after he was in, that, in the room there afterwards, that Jesus was indeed alive. Thomas, we've seen him, he appeared to us. He came and he entered the room there, and we saw him. We saw his hands. We saw his side. And then Thomas declares, well, unless I, unless I see him and I see those wounds himself, not just touch them, put my hand on them, but to see, yuck, I just think that I want to put my finger in, this, in the nail hole there and I want to put my hand in his side. Now, I, I really, really want proof that it's not just a, a, a hallucination or, or a figment of my imagination or a hologram or something that's in front of me, but I want to feel with my own hands that it really is Jesus. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe. 
And we know those words that he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And ever since then, he's been dubbed the doubter. Poor guy. Which isn't really fair. Because when you think of it, the other disciples were in the same position. They doubted. They didn't believe it until Jesus appeared in front of them. They had the eyewitness accounts, but they wanted to have their own eyewitness account. So in reality, we should call all the disciples doubters. You know, Matthew the doubter, Mark the doubter, John the doubter. You know, go, go through the whole list. Not just Thomas the doubter. They were no different for Thomas. They also wanted that first-hand proof of what the others had seen and experienced. We all struggle with doubts at one time or another. And specifically, we doubt decisions that we've made. Was it a wise choice? What will the repercussions be? Will it be sustainable? Will others benefit from it? There's lots of, th lots of doubts that we have in our minds. And I think that's what makes Thomas so relatable to us. Because he was, he was this bundle of paradoxes which we are as well. You know, we believe, but we doubt. We hope, but we get discouraged. We love, but sometimes we hate. In Jude chapter 1, verse 22, Jude encourages us to be merciful to those who doubt. Don't just kick them out. Be merciful to them, because they're doubting. Help them in their unbelief. But Thomas, Thomas wasn't the only one who struggled, if we look in the Word of God, right through Scripture. There are many biblical characters who were in much the same position as Thomas when it comes to, comes to doubting. Job doubted. Moses doubted. Elijah doubted. Even David, the man after God's own heart, doubted at times. And John the Baptist is probably the most unexpectant doubter. He was faced with a crisis there at the end of his life and he was in a place that was, was really bad. He was in prison and he had his, some of his disciples with him and he was taking great emotional strain. And in Matthew 11 verse 3, he asks about Jesus. Are you the one who was to come or are we to expect somebody else? Now John the Baptist has seen what's happened. He baptized Jesus and saw what happened with the dove coming down and the voice out of the heavens. Here he is. Are you the one? Or are we to expect somebody else? And I think we're all, much like John, um, probably the most susceptible to doubt when the world is heavy on our shoulders. Now it's then that we start thinking, really? Is it worth it? Lord, you said, but now this. The things aren't turning out for John the, the way John the Baptist expected. However, it, even in his doubt, even in that, that time when he was doubting whether Jesus was the one that, that was, was prophesied about and that, still doubted. Jesus described John the Baptist in, in, Mark, in Luke chapter 7, verse 28, as the greatest man born of woman. But here's John doubting. <coughs> Jesus offers us a secret of, of why we doubt. It's because we're human. We're made of dust. And, but the interesting thing is, though, with John the Baptist, when he doubted, what did he do with his doubt? He didn't just disrupt disregard everything and go in on his own way. He took his doubt straight to Jesus. Are you the one? Are you the one? And Thomas did much the same. Unless I see, I want the proof. Lord, show, give me the proof. Take my, un, my doubting heart away. Give me a, a heart of faith. We can doubt. It's no problem, no harm in doubting. It's not, not sinning. As long as our thoughts lead us back to Christ when we doubt. Sometimes doubt feels like we're swimming in a, in a dam full of crocodiles. 
you, we're swimming around there and the doubts are scary. You've got these crocodiles coming towards you. We, we saw one in, in Kruger on, on, where did we go? Monday. Monday when we went in with Sandra. Um, there at that dam, first dam from Pabeni Gate. It was a huge thing. And they, he must have just caught the impala because he was thrashing around in the water just on the right hand side. And next thing he comes out with just the leg in his mouth, looking all proud, you know, baring his teeth to everybody. Can you imagine swimming in that dam with all those crocs? Now that, that's what, what doubt can feel like sometimes. Instead, we should rather be taking those doubts to Jesus. Not swimming in them the whole time. Take those doubts to Jesus. Because the way that we win over doubt is to take it to Jesus. And when we take our doubts to him, he becomes that bridge that goes over the doubts that takes us to the other side, that takes us back to that point of faith in Him. But we need to be honest about our doubts. In Matthew 28, verse 17, we read, When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. He's talking about the disciples themselves, just before Jesus ascends to heaven. The disciples were over there. Some of them were overjoyed and worshipped Him, but some doubted Him. Some doubted the resurrected Christ was who he claimed to be. But Thomas, he was the honest one. He was that honest one. Mark to chapter 9, what Carol read there, is the story of this father that brings his son to Jesus. And this boy has been struggling with, with seizures and this possession, and it's been throwing him into the fire, it's been throwing him into the water trying to kill him. And this man comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus reply, if you can, do you realize who you're talking to? If you can, you know, everything is possible for him who believes. And immediately the father exclaims, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. There's a difference. Doubt is the mind battling to make sense of it all. Unbelief is a matter of the will. Unbelief is when we refuse to believe God's word and obey his commands. It's a lack of commitment. And there have been some great, great saints of, of the faith through the years, through the centuries that have struggled with doubt. I'm not talking about people in the Bible. I'm talking about people that, that have shown us God's word and expounded God's word to us. But still they finished the course in faith, even though they had the doubt. You might have heard of this guy, John Wesley. You might have met him sometime or something. But he's the, the founder of Methodism. He, he wrestled with doubts. Maybe you've heard of his conversion experience, the Aldersgate back in 1738, when he, he mentions that his heart was strangely warmed by the presence of God, and he knew that he was a child of God. And we expect, well, everything was hunky-dory, life, you know, happily ever after from then on. But it wasn't. There was a point in his life, less than a year later, where he wrote in his journal, I know that I am not a Christian. I know because I do not feel that I love God and his son Jesus Christ as my Savior. Less than a year after having that, that feeling that his heart was strangely warmed. What had happened? Doubt had set in. Doubt had set into his own life. But if you read the accounts later, he led a, a great spiritual awakening within England great revival of the church within England, which spilled over into America. And there was a revival there as well. John Wesley had taken his doubt and not just disregarded everything, but he took his, his doubt to Jesus and Jesus changed his heart again, brought him back to that point of faith and used him as a mighty servant. The Welsh minister, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, if your faith bothers you, it's not your heart, but in your head. If your faith bothers you, it's not in your heart, but in your head. 
So if your doubt displeases you, if, if your doubt makes you feel uneasy, it's because the Lord is dwelling in you and His Holy Spirit is convicting you. If you're feeling uneasy about it. So what do we do? We hand it over to Jesus. We hand that doubt over to Him and then exclaim with Thomas, my Lord and my God. So what do we do with the doubts? Because we all get them. What do we do with them? Well, we ask God to set our experience of doubt so that it can be used for His glory. So that we can use it as a witness to bring others to, to faith in Christ. Because the enemy would like nothing more than to take our doubts and destroy us. To turn us away from Christ. Because doubts, like suffering, is a tool that God can use for His glory. But only when we turn it over to Him. We've got to be willing to say, Lord, take my unbelief, take my doubt, turn it to faith, so that others can receive faith from you. And I think Christ is, is probably the, the best example of, of that. You know, whether, we, whether it was there in the wilderness, where Christ was after His baptism, or in the Garden of Gethsemane before his betrayal and his arrest, or whether it was there as he was hanging on the cross. Jesus only had one goal, and that was that his Father be honored and glorified through it all. Jesus turned to what he knew rather than dwelling on the doubts. Lord, why am I going? Father, you know, don't really want to do this. I'm doubting that things are going to work out and whatever, but I'm trusting you. He turned to his Father's word because anything that contradicts the word of God is a lie. So when the devil comes into your life with those doubts and twists scripture to go, you know, tell him to go and just turn to God and allow him to turn those doubts into faith. And that's what Thomas does. Thomas turns to Jesus. We don't know if Thomas actually physically did put his finger in, in the, the nail scars or put his hand in Jesus' side. But after Jesus had told him, stop doubting and believe, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Thomas's declaration and his confession were way greater than his doubt. I read this the other day and I thought it was cleverly worded. Thomas's bout with doubt was conquered by a personal encounter. Thomas's bout with doubt was, was conquered by a personal encounter. With who? With the living Jesus. The living Jesus. And ours can be as well. But the remedy for doubt is faith. And faith comes from, as, what is, as Paul says in Romans 10 verse 11, from hearing the Word of God. From hearing the Word of God. See, God has given us His Word. He's given us the Bible as a testimony of His works in the past. We can read it and say, wow, look what God did. Look what He did. And so, so we will, instead of having the, the doubts in Him, we will have reason to trust Him in the present because of what we see that He's done in the past. As the psalmist wrote, which was part of our call to worship, Psalm 77, verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. When we do that, that will dispel all the doubt because we're remembering the things that God has done in the past. In order for us to have faith in God, we've got to study to know what He has said. We've got to study His Word. And once we, we have that understanding of what God has done in the past, what He's promised for us in the present, and what we can expect from Him in the future, we're able to act in faith instead of doubt. We know that the Bible is unique, because as Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, that it is God-breathed. It's not just the thoughts of man, but it's God-breathed. Through the, through the, um, into, into man and then put on paper. And even though we, we open it up and the words on the pages look like ordinary words, 
those words are inspired by his Holy Spirit. Because God's word even judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. As Paul writes in Romans 15 verse 4, his word encourages us. It satisfies us and sustains us in Matthew 4 verse 4. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 119 verse 105, it guides us even better than a GPS. The Bible also simultaneously reveals God to us. What he's like. What he loves. What he hates. And the more that we learn about the person of God, the more our faith will increase. And the less we will doubt. When Thomas saw Jesus and believed, he received that gentle rebuke from Jesus. He says, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. We can have confidence even in the, the things that we cannot see because God has proven himself as being faithful, as being true, and being able in all circumstances. So don't, don't be afraid of your doubts, but use them as a way of gaining a deeper understanding of God, of deepening your walk with Jesus and of allowing His Holy Spirit to take you further from your present understanding of God. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we can be so weak and sinful in our separation from You. And sometimes we don't trust others. Or there are seeds of doubt that begin to creep in because of lies that have been planted there by the enemy. Maybe we become prideful and we turn away. But Father, we know that your Holy Spirit lives within all of your children. And so Lord, please use your Holy Spirit to show us the truth and, and to convict our hearts of the, the evidence of your goodness and your glory. Enable us, us to push our own will aside in, in favor of your Spirit within us. Your Spirit, who opens our eyes to your way and to your plan. Remove any doubt and increase our belief. And like Thomas, help us move away from our unbelief and to shrug off or any worries and concerns that we have and to simply rest in you and to believe. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen.